Welcome to the Jewish Education Experience Podcast with your hosts, Yasmina and Ari, who will be uncovering gems of wisdom with Jewish educators from around the world. To our audience, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support, and we appreciate you sharing our podcast with others also. Please consider supporting our podcast financially by contributing via Zelle, Jewish Education Podcast at gmail.com, or by joining our Patreon community, www.patreon.com forward slash Jewish Education Experience Podcast. And to all of you Jewish educators and students of Jewish education around the world, Chizchu ve'imtsu. May you be strengthened and encouraged in your holy endeavors. Please remember to hit that subscribe button so that you'll be notified whenever we post a new video. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this podcast may not necessarily be those of the hosts. Our guest today is Danit Shusterman, and she is a certified Montessori primary teacher and educational consultant with over 20 years of experience. She is the author of a Jewish homeschool blog, which I happen to use a lot of their resources from her blog, and published a kosher cookbook called Maui Kosher. Danit homeschooled her five children on the island of Maui, Hawaii, where she and her husband ran Chabad of Maui for 13 years. And currently she she designs curriculums and is a freelance writer. Well, Danit, very impressive, all the things that you've accomplished and Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today on our podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. Will you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you began your journey in education? As far back as I can remember, I, I think I have a family home video of when I was five years old and my father saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a teacher. And so I, I, it's something I've always always wanted to do. I just, I always wanted to be a teacher. I just, I, I love education. It was just kind of as I, I went to seminary after high school. Um, I, I worked in Hebrew schools. I, I just, I've always, always been teaching. It's just something I've always loved doing. I love working with kids. It just, it came very naturally to me. Um, and I, I got my bachelor's and I got married and moved to Maui, Hawaii with my husband, where we ran um, Chabad of Maui for 13 years. And obviously there's no Jewish schools on Maui. So I homeschooled my kids um, until my oldest turned to 11. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Is your husband also from this part of the country or not he, he, no, he's, from, he's from long beach california okay wow yeah. very cool oh. and so now you're not on hawaii islands anymore you're back on the mainland um yeah um you know as my kids got older my husband and i realized that they need more um, you know, it's not, it, it wasn't fun anymore to homeschool. They were in, um, the Shluchim online school, which is a wonderful program that, um, is provided to Chabad Shluchim around the world whose children aren't in an actual school. So it's a, you know, you've got, I remember kids in my kids' classes, there was a kid from, um, Vancouver, a kid from Northern California, um, you know, just from all over the world. And these kids came together for like three, four hours a day and they did school together with a teacher and assignments, like actual school. Um, but it, it just, my kids wanted more. They would, you know, I want to be in a, you know, a school and we would bring them to New York in the summer. And every time we left, you know, Hawaii is probably, I mean, Maui, where we lived is probably one of the most beautiful places on the planet I mean it is just it's breathtakingly beautiful and we would come to Brooklyn in the summer and Brooklyn is not very beautiful (laughs) to say the least (laughs) but my kids just blossomed here they loved being with lots of other kids they loved being in camp they 
They love the freedom of running to the store by themselves. They love being around family. And every time we left, they would beg us, like, please, can we live here? Please, can we move here? Please, can we yeah. live in Brooklyn? So, um, you know, as they got older, it just, the decision was just made that they needed more. And in Brooklyn, there's a lot of Jewish, you know, Chabad schools here that we could choose from. I have family here. I'm originally from here. So it was just the next, the next step that we were going to take. And we took it. And, you know, thank God. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. It's been really great. Aren't there a lot of like Chabad homeschool curriculums to choose from in that regard? Um, there's a couple of preschool curriculums, but as the kids get older, like, you know, elementary school, definitely not high school. I, I think the Shulchan online school actually stops in eighth grade. You know, you've got the Shulchan online school. They don't, as far as I know, there is no homeschool elementary curriculum for the for the for the Chabad Shluchim. So like most, I think majority of Shluchim who live in places that do not have a school, their kids are in the online school or they go to like a day school or whatever else is available there. Okay, so did you do some of that and then you also created your own stuff? Well, what happened was I'm a very creative person. And to me, I just homeschooling my kids, I, I couldn't imagine making it dry and like, you know, circle time. And like, I just, I needed to do something that would fulfill me at the same time. So, you know, I would just scour the internet for ideas. Um, you know, Montessori was just, it like called my name. I just, I love the whole philosophy. I love learning through the five senses. Um, I agree. I, yeah, like it just, you know, and, and I having five kids, they're all such different learners. And I was able to cater to their different learning styles through the way I, you know, through all my research. And the blog started as a way to just document what I was doing and send it to my mother. You know, like, wow. don't worry, your grandkids are okay. This is what we did this week. <laughs> Well, you I got to say that we really appreciate that you put together your blog because like I said, I've used your materials. It's really amazing. No, I'm so I'm so glad. And, and I get, I mean, hundreds of emails from people around the globe. I mean, I had a woman in in Paris ask me if she could translate one of the booklets that I made for her for her preschool class. Um, someone in Cambodia. I mean, like, from around the globe, people are using the stuff that I made just for my own kids, you know, and I enjoy doing it. I love graphic art. My father's a graphic artist. So to me, this was like using that skill in a way that could benefit my kids. But at the same time, it was really fun for me to do, to like design the booklets and do the research and find the pictures and it was a really fun creative process for me, which in turn, it was so nice to, you know, spread. I mean, to this day, I mean, it's, it's years already that, that I published it and I get emails all the time and it's really nice. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a nice thing to see that the stuff I did with my kids, it took them two minutes to do the project that I planned like an hour the night before. That sounds about but, right. Um, yeah, so, but it's nice to know that it's like, you know, affecting the rest of the world. So it was worth it. Yeah, so, so. you said you pretty much knew you were going to be an educator when you were about five years old. Um, were there any educators that you particularly admired? As a kid, I can't really say I remember specific teachers that stood out in my mind. But as I got older, what really, really stood out for me was, you know, being, um, you know, a Lubavitcher woman, I just always marveled at how the Lubavitcher Rebbe sees each person for who they are and meets them where they're at. And I found this a tremendous tool in educating mm -hmm. because when you're teaching children, you know, whether it's five, 10, 15, 20 kids, Every kid is literally their own world. I mean, you guys have little kids and I'm sure you could see like each kid 
is their own planet. They all they, they have their own needs and you connect to them in a different way. And this was a tremendous influence for me as an educator in meeting kids where they're at. For sure. Well, we, we also really respect the rabbit. I mean, he's pretty amazing the things he was able to accomplish. Wow. Just how you incorporated God with learning with your children, how you incorporated it with building a Jewish homeschool blog. Yeah. How did you do it? Um, I think by, you know, for example, let's say we're learning about, let's say it's, you know, Shavuot and we're learning about flowers. And I mean, we were lucky. We lived in Hawaii. So godliness was right outside the window, literally. I mean, you just need to look at, I mean, I always used to say like, I'm probably the only mother who's putting her kids to sleep. And I would like get sidetracked by looking at the sunset out the window at just, it was just so incredibly magnificent. And I think in regards to homeschooling, noticing, just noticing like the godliness in everything that we do. Um, If we planted a garden, wow, isn't this amazing how we put a seed into the ground Uh, a month ago and look what Hashem has given us. Hashem has given us cucumbers and like, isn't that incredible as opposed to like just noticing, Oh, we planted a seed and now we have cucumbers. So it was really just about, you know, making it acknowledging the godliness in everything that we're doing. And, you know, even in my teaching, I, I, I teach science and making it a science lesson it's like, isn't it amazing how Hashem made herbivores have, you know, molars to chew their food? And isn't it amazing how Hashem gave each animal whatever they need in order to survive? So it's not, nec- you know, it's just taking everything that we learn and acknowledging how he made this all happen. And we're learning about it. Definitely. Yeah, very nice. Um, so education or chenoch in Hebrew can be an amorphous term. How do you define education? Education. Wow. Education. I really think it is taking a child, looking at the child, believing in the child, having the child believe in themselves and letting them know how much they are capable of doing. It's not about a subject. It's not about filling them with information. It's not about spoon feeding them facts. It's about making the child almost into a vessel to just receive whatever they learn. So kind of like positive encouragement, like self-esteem stuff? Definitely. Because you can take a classroom full of kids And each kid is going to have their own experience in that classroom. We educate. It's very important also to me as an educator to be an example of just a good human being for kids because kids are so smart. Kids are so smart. I think if, I think if educators understood how perceptive and smart kids are, I think the whole system would be completely different. I think it's so important to have a relationship with your students and connect with your students. It's not about controlling your classroom or your students. It's about controlling the environment. And by controlling the environment, the way you control it is by by connection. And when, when you trust your students, they feel trusted. And uh, there's no power struggle. There's no battle because when you have a connection and you have trust, it just, it works. It works. There's, there's, there's no, the kids aren't afraid. They feel comfortable. They feel relaxed. They feel like you believe in them. They feel, it's, it, it really just, I, and I'm saying this from full experience, that when you, when you have that atmosphere in the classroom, that's education. That's when your child, the, the kids are so ready and willing and open to listen and to learn. And they, they want to hear what the teacher has to say, because there's just this mutual respect that's going on. 
that that that, that was the thoughts that I try to put into words. That was good. That I had before. Well, I definitely have experienced that too when I was teaching in the classroom. The the more you are able to connect with them and build that relationship, they the more they're inspired to learn, and it's it's really cool to watch them blossom. You were able to transition in your your kids from you homeschooling them to then going to a Chabad school. They were so used to, I guess, learning in a different way. What were some of the benefits that you saw? What were some of the challenges maybe in that adjustment? Well, I don't know how many um, listeners of yours are homeschoolers, but I really hope you have a few that are going to hear this. I was terrified to put my kids in school. I'm making quotation marks, you know, their socialization. They had never been, I mean, aside for camp, but they, they, they just had each other on Maui and friends, but friends that we would see on Shabbos. We wouldn't really see so many kids during the week. And I was afraid for them academically, you know, as a homeschooling mom, did I do enough? Had they learned enough in the Shulchan online school? Had they done enough? I mean, I'm sure you see, you know, kids on Zoom. It's, there's only so much you can do when it's over the computer. And I was really scared. All five of them, we came to Brooklyn. I put them in three different schools. Each school was fit for each kid. Baruch Hashem. Socially, they were fine. Um, academically, they were fine. I, I think the only issue was academically handwriting was the biggest challenge for them because in school you write a lot more than when you were homeschooled at least the way I homeschooled my kids so they just the fluency of handwriting like taking notes sitting in the classroom and taking notes they didn't do that with me so just uh, it took them maybe a month a month and a half to kind of get up to up to grade level in in, in that regard mm -hmm. um I know one of my kids needed like a math tutor for a month just to get her up to grade level as well. Um, also, because when you're homeschooling and your kid's like, I don't want to do math. It's like, okay, don't do math. What are we doing now? <laughs> so, you know, it was like, it's true. Yeah. So it's like a little different, but they, thank God, they really, no one had any learning disabilities or anything like that. So for a child that is just like an average learner, if, you, if they're being homeschooled, chances are they should be fine. Maybe, you know, in one or two subjects, they might need a little, in the skill-based subjects, they might need a little bit of extra help, like for a couple of weeks. Socially, what people don't realize is when you homeschool, you have, I'm sure you guys went to school and you have a, you, you have kids in school that sat in the back of the classroom that didn't speak to anyone for 12 years. They were quiet. They were the wallflower. They didn't want to be there and school didn't work. And then you have homeschoolers who are, you know, I have my own kids. Like I have some kids, they're social butterflies. They came to school and they made friends in two days. And the next thing you know, like it's as if they were never not in school. So it's really, you know, your social skills begin at home. If you have a healthy situation at home where everyone communicates and you argue properly and, you know, it's chances are they will be totally, totally fine going into regular school. So that, you know, that was our experience. Thank God. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah, Mazel Tov. Good yeah, job. for sure. Definitely gave myself a pat on my back, even though I, sh you know, I should have been like, thank you, Hashem, right away. But I was like, good job, mom, you know? I was like, thank you, Hashem. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if, it would, if you would have gotten like three of five, that would have been like a good job. Right. You got five right. of five, it's like, bar for sure. Now, did your all husband right. also participate at all in homeschooling? No, he did no. not. It, it, okay. He's he was dad. He was he's not. No, it was not his thing. He wanted to connect with our kids on it as a father, not as a teacher. You know, he, he'd listen to their inspired Torahs and you know, great job, beautiful. But like in regards to what they did daily, you know, they'll show him stuff that he that they did. But he was okay. not. You know, that was my thing. That was my department. Yeah. So just real quick, in, in Hawaii, it, there's like a small Jewish community there? Such a transient place. It's not really a community. People are constantly moving there, leaving. You know, it's a tiny island, but yet you have like subcultures all over the island. You have, you know, the, the fancy part where people live in gated communities. You've got the hippie part where people live in tents. You've got the regular suburbia where you live in a cul-de-sac with a, a basketball hoop and, wow. you know, your two dogs. So there wasn't one community. There are about 2,000 Jews that live on Maui, but it's not like this tight-knit community. Right. So I mean, you get That's a lot of visitors 
coming through and stopping by? That's all my kids knew. They only knew right. of friends that visited on Shabbos and that they'll probably never see them again. <laughs> like, wow. and, and that was normal. That was, you know, I remember my sisters coming to visit me and when they left, they were like, why are your kids not crying that we're leaving? You know, why are they not upset? I'm like, they're used to this. They're used, used to, to people coming and attaching and goodbye. See ya. Thanks. So so what was the biggest challenge that you faced as an educator? Uh, in Hawaii or in, in general? In general. Well, in Hawaii, we know you got distracted by the sunset, but. <laughs> yes. I, and, and you know what? Even in Brooklyn, believe it or not, I'll be in the middle of <laughs> teaching. And, it, and on those winter, those like winter nights when the sun sets at like four something, I'll like literally tell the class, you guys, just a second before dismissal. And I'll like go to the window and take a picture of the beautiful sunset. I'll be like, OK, <laughs> now you can all leave. So it's I'm like, so you know, the Miss Frizzle, you know, in, in Crown Heights. Um, Come full circle. Right, exactly. <laughs> but the biggest challenge of as, uh, being an educator. Like, do you think, um, uh, just a quick side question, like, do you think yeah. that your kids, like, were harder than other students or vice versa? No, uh, no. I mean, I got my kids, thank God, are they're, they're good students. They do well at school. Um, you know, I love what I do. So what's hard about it um I mean I'm not saying it's an easy job we know it's far from an easy job um maybe it's hard when I I really want to reach a kid and I'm having a hard time doing that that's that's hard I mean I can't really think it's, it's a challenging job but it's a, a great it's like saying what's hard about motherhood you know like I don't know like <laughs> it, it, you know like it's a it's, it's such a fulfilling thing to do that I you know I don't there's nothing that I think oh gosh I wish this was different it's you know it's a challenge and it's it's a good challenge but I, I can't <laughs> think of like a specific challenge what have other people said are like a challenge of being an educator connecting connecting with this like you said having that student that maybe you're trying so hard to connect with um some of our other educators have mentioned just covid dealing with the online learning um those are probably um, the main things yeah but oh yeah i was not a fan of zoom at all it's especially the type of teacher that I am. You know, I also, I'm very lucky because where I work, my boss is amazing. She really, she just has so much faith in me as a teacher and she really lets me just do my thing. And I'm very blessed like that. So I think maybe if I worked in a different place where I had to do like the full frontal teaching, it would be extremely, extremely challenging for me. But the fact that I'm given, you know, the freedom to just educate the way I, the way it works for me and it works for the kids, it's been a huge blessing for me. So. Right. It sounds like you're just very naturally kind of yeah. motivated and driven. Like, I mean, you're kind of, you're really lucky, you know, that you just had that always. And that you still I, have I, I think, think so. And here I'm going to say Baruch Hashem, because we all have different types of personalities. Hashem wires us differently. And some people are wired, you know, they're really good with finances and they are really responsible. Or some people are super organized and they just run this incredibly organized household. I wish I had that, but that I don't. And I have to work really hard for that. But it, when it comes to teaching and connecting with kids and just seeing who they are and meeting them where they are. It really, it comes very, very naturally. And I, I thank Hashem every day for it because it's something I love. I love it. I love going to work every day. It's, it's something I really enjoy. You know, even Zoom, it was such a challenge, but we made the best of it. And I saw, it was amazing. I saw certain students of mine who were so quiet in class, they were the ones who blossomed during Zoom. And the loud socialites were the ones who like were crumbling. They were having such a hard time during Zoom. Wow, so even, so you know, that's so interesting. That is. Yeah. So even though Zoom was challenging for me, it just gave me so much joy to see the students who usually were the wallflowers suddenly blossoming and they got their chance to shine, which if not for Zoom, they would never have been given that opportunity to shine. So that made me that made me happy. You know, I'm not going to talk about my own kids who are sitting upside down on the couch with the iPad, you know, like, you know, no comment <laughs> was going funny. on in my own house. But um, yeah, but that really goes kids. that really goes back to what you said about the Rebbe also, like the finding the, you know, individual and in each student, right. you know, it's like the from Michele, right? It, it's such a huge, the Rebbe was such a huge example for me because he met every single Jew from all walks of life. I mean, like, 
uh, people who just found out they were Jewish to, you know, different types of Hasidim. And he just, he, he looked past everything. He just looked straight into their soul. And I, you know, to me, having a class of kids look past everything and just look at each kid for who they are and what they need and zoom in on that. And you've got yourself a successful classroom. It just, okay. it just works. So what advice would you give to new educators who may just be beginning their journeys in the field? My advice to a new educator is it's not about you as a teacher, it's not about you walking in, establishing authority. You know, I'm sure a lot of educators hear that, you know, walk in, show them who's boss, let them know mm. they can't mess with you. Um, it, it's really about And you have to get to this place. It's not something you can get overnight, but it's about letting the kids know that you trust them, that they are more capable than they could ever imagine. And you are there to watch them blossom into the amazing human beings that they can all become. But it has to be real. It has to be real. And when a kid feels this, it's like they want to prove you right. Like, Uh I could do this. I could do this. You know, like, okay, fine. If you okay if you think I can do it okay I can do it so to me that you know it's a journey but it's pretty awesome when you see it actually happening yeah so, I agree how can we help students build a proper Torah fan base oh wow like I'm assuming obviously with the Chabad curriculum you're teaching Torah Mina Shemayim right, like you're right. teaching it's like very traditional obviously um, I'll tell you you can teach Torah from today till tomorrow a kid needs to be happy and a kid needs to be relaxed and a kid needs to be calm, and a kid needs to be secure. Wow. And when they're, when they're all of those things, they will be receptive to all the words of Torah that you teach them. If a kid is terrified of their teacher, they can be sitting there, nothing's going to go in. They're going to be sitting there so stressed. Out. If a kid is stressed, if they know they have to be, you know, what do we have to know? And we have to make sure that we know this. And You know, if the kid is stressed, they're not going to like learning Hamash. Yeah, they're not. That makes sense. You know, if, if they're connected to their teacher, if the learning environment is a calm, warm, comfortable environment, whatever you're learning, the kids are really going to like it because it's just, it just feels good. It feels nice. So that, you know, it's not really about, you know, the content. It's more about the environment and setting up in a way that they'll be receptive to whatever it is that you're teaching. Definitely, because we want them to continue to want to learn long term so that it's a lifelong process. So that Correct. makes sense. All right. And the same thing at home, you know, like you want to have a, a positive Torah foundation. May, I, I just heard something really beautiful. Someone, uh, I, I wish I had his, I, I don't know what his name is. He's a rabbi. And he said, you know, you want to make Shabbos so enjoyable for your kids. Make it fun. Make it enjoyable. Play games. Meet the kid where they're at. Make it fun, make it enjoyable, make it this warm, wonderful experience for them to look back on and to connect to, as opposed to just kind of like a ritual. This is what we do. This is why we do it. End of story. So the same thing in the, yeah, same thing in the house. You, you know, we, some of us grew up with it. Some of us, you know, we're just learning about it, but you want to make it this, this, this warm, loving environment that we're doing Torah and Mitzvahs. And then the kids will ultimately like that's that's the connection that they'll feel always, not like forced or limiting and boundaries and laws and rules, as opposed to oh, this is like the one day a week where family time and we play games and we get to have chocolate cake for breakfast and you know like and we get to stay up Friday night and we get you know like it should be like this fun, nice feeling Torah in our houses. Definitely, I agree with that. Um, where do you teach now? Do you teach in a Chabad school currently or is it a Montessori school? No, I teach in a Chabad girls yeshiva. I teach fourth grade. I okay. actually teach English subjects and it's it's just a regular, you know, regular wow. yeshiva. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 like I said, my boss is amazing and she lets you know, she gives me free, right. You know, she knows if she comes into my classroom, there's going to be kids laying on the floor. There's going to be kids <laughs> sitting on the floor. There's going to be wow. kids sitting on their desk. There's going to be two kids sitting outside, but 
there's always learning going on. Always, mm-hmm. always, always. Everyone is always engaged and always busy and always curious. And there's always projects and there's always painting and there's always creating. And the proof is in the pudding. These kids, they, they learn. They learn. They leave class and they, you know, they graduate their little fourth grade and they, they've learned a lot. So I wonder so, how many more kids would, so to speak, stick with Judaism if there were more educators that were open to, what do you say, outside of the box type of learning? I think it's huge. It's huge because so many kids are turned away from, you know, different things in Judaism because of an unfortunate experience at school. Um, I, I just think that by, you know, teachers, you know, being an example, showing their love for Torah and their love for mitzvahs and, and practicing K- like kids, like I said before, they're smart. They, they, they can sniff authenticity. They really, really can. And when you have authentic teachers, when you have people that are just, you know, what you see is what you get the real deal and just open for connection. Kids feel that and they connect to it. And it really, it makes a really big difference. It really, really does. For sure. Yeah. So I guess we didn't really get to get into in some of the like Montessori stuff, like the influence. The, but I guess people will just have to kind of check out what you do and and, and learn more on their own. Um, what, so what do you think successful Jewish education in the future looks like? Um, successful Jewish education looks like educators taking themselves out of the equation. It's not about me. It's about each child, meeting each child where they're at. Um, Once again, connecting with the kids, trusting the kids, creating that relationship with the kids. And it's, it's almost kind of like a slam dunk that when you have that connection with kids, I mean, it's the same thing with parenting same thing with parenting right. when you are when you're connected to your kids it doesn't necessarily mean your kids are doing every single thing you want them to do but you have that connection then you will always be connected you always will be and when you accept them for who they are and not try fit them into a box that is just not meant for them you know you've got your creative students they you know worksheets aren't meant for them and then you've got the kids they love worksheets they don't want to color and paint look at each kid you know see where they're at and meet them there it's not about taking the kid and putting them into your box because that has been tried and that has failed that has not worked so if we as educators can all come together and it's not easy it is not easy but if we can come together and when you walk into a classroom You're not teaching one, one box, you're teaching 20 different kids. And if you're able to meet each kid where they are and connect with each kid as an individual, establish a relationship with those kids where they trust you and you know that you trust them, there's your foundation. You can teach, you know, everything. So where does the curriculum fit in with all that? Like, do you think that parents and teachers have a responsibility to like create their own curriculums on, obviously you're saying don't try to, you know, create the curriculum for the teacher and force that on the students. But when you say curriculum, you mean the Torah curriculum, whatever it is you're doing in class, I guess, like the, you know, I mean, obviously you have like each day you've got like your lessons and stuff, but like overall, usually you have like the curriculum for the year, you know? I mean, I, I really, that's kind of like secondary because what the kids are learning is you're just, you're giving them information. So yeah, curriculum is important. You want to have a good curriculum, but at the same time, you can have the state of the art curriculum, but if your students are terrified of you or if your students don't respect you, that curriculum means nothing. Right. So, or you can have this incredible connection with your kids and maybe you're in a situation where your school doesn't have an amazing curriculum, but you can take whatever you have and make it amazing. You can make it wonderful. You can make it so much fun. A tiny example, this year for finals, for my little fourth graders, you know, learned about animals. Instead of having a, an actual test, I gave them each clay and they got a piece of paper and it said, okay, create two mammals, create two reptiles, create two amphibians. And they had to do this out of clay instead of just writing the answer. So there's, there's so many ways to meet 
these kids and to inspire them. You don't need state of the art fancy curriculums. Right. They're great. They're great. I'm not. I'm not saying they shouldn't be written and they shouldn't be available and everyone should use them. But it's not a make or break situation if you don't have these incredible curriculums at your fingertips. Well, that makes sense because I think sometimes as educators and maybe even as parents too, when we think about how we want to prepare our kids so that we're giving them the proper foundation. We want them to know this, this, and this about being Jewish and their Jewish identity. We tend to think, oh, we have to do so much. And maybe sometimes, like you said, we just need to take a step back and really connect with our kids first and all of that well, will kind of come. A hundred, a hundred percent, because I mean, you can have the most halachically perfect Shabbos table set up and you're you know, your whole Shabbos could be like to the T perfect. But if your kid, if you're not connected to your kid or, or one child, like what is that? How is that going to help you? And when you have that connection, it just, it, it pulls everything together. It pulls everything together when you have the relationship and when you have the connection, it's like the sky's the limit when, when you're connected. It really, really is. Right. Well, thank you for that. I definitely think we, uh, can take away a lot from this interview with you. And I actually just have another question. Did you grow up Chabad? We grew up very close to Chabad. I guess you could say it's like modern Orthodox. I grew up in South Africa as a kid. So like... Very cool. Yeah, it's like very traditional. But as I got older, we we became a lot more and more observant. So, okay. so maybe, do you think we could end with... Uh maybe like a Rebbe story, like, I don't know, your parents or maybe your husband's parents, like, did they ever uh, have the opportunity to meet him? Well, um, interestingly, um, my family, we moved from South Africa to Atlanta, Georgia in 1992. I was 13. And we, we immigrated because things in South Africa were, you know, very unstable, like politically. And we moved to South Africa, uh, we moved to Atlanta and we, you know, like I said, we were very traditional, you know, I guess borderline modern Orthodox, but there was at that time, now it's huge, the Jewish community in Atlanta, but back then it was a very small Jewish community and there wasn't any, like, we couldn't find a community where we felt at home. And slowly but surely our family became more and more Chabad because we were always close to Chabad. And, you know, to cut a very long story short, we wanted to move to Crown Heights. And at the time, the Rebbe was alive. So my parents wrote a letter to the Rebbe oh. and asked for a blessing to move to Crown Heights. I, maybe a week or so later, we got a phone call. And I remember this so clearly. Um, Rabbi Groner, who was the Rebbe's secretary. Oh, yeah. Called, <laughs> yeah, he a, a blessed memory. And he called my father and he said, the Rebbe got your letter about wanting to move to Crown Heights. And... He wants to let you know he's giving you and your family a blessing to move wow. to Crown Heights. And he also wants to add that it will be the best thing that you will ever do for your family. Wow. So we were very excited about that. And to top it off, when we did move to Crown Heights, we just stayed with a family and we needed a place to live. My mother was a, was like signing us up for school and she was speaking to the principal and my mother just like burst into tears and the principal's like, what's going on? And she's like, we don't have a place to live. We just moved to Crown Heights. That's almost the school year. We can't stay, you know, with people. And the principal said, do me a favor. She wrote down a number. She said, my parents are renting out um, the, the first floor of their house. It's the house next door to 770. Whoa. And, um, <laughs> and so she cool. said, you know, call my mother. I know that they're putting names on a list. They're going to give it into the Rebbe. And the Rebbe is going to let them know who, you know, should move there. And she called them and we got a phone call that we got a blessing from the Rebbe to move into the house next to 770. Our, our address was 760 Eastern Parkway. <laughs> that is so, so cool. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to grow up there. A lot of fun. Well, I can imagine. Yeah. I, mean, I read his, the book about him a few years ago. It's just really amazing what he's accomplished. But, and, it's, you guys get, got to grow up around that and experience that. So that's really cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was it was pretty awesome. It was pretty awesome. So uh, well, yeah, we just want to thank you for 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 talking with us. This was really good for us. And uh okay. well uh you know, wishing you lots of like Hatzlacha and Bracha. Thank um, you. Thank you, know. you. You guys too. And and again, I just 
I cannot thank you enough for the work that you put into building up your blog and all the the fact that you're willing to share your resources and uh, like I we really appreciate it. Yeah, so. you're inspiring. That's, that's, that's funny. I, I don't know if, if if you'll put it on the on, on the, the podcast or not, but I remember when I would put all the stuff up on the blog, a lot of people were saying to me, why don't you charge people for it? You know, like you'll make so much money. So I was speaking to my husband, the rabbi, the shliach, and I was like, should we, you know, should I charge, you know, should I put a price on it? And he's like, listen, this is Torah and it's for children. If you put a price on it, maybe you'll meet, you know, a few hundred people will download it, which will be very nice. And you'll make yourself a few hundred dollars. And then he's like, but if it's free, you will reach thousands and thousands and thousands of children so i was like okay we'll make it free and <laughs> it's and, it, and it's really true how it really really has it, it's like reached thousands and thousands of people and it's just it's really nice it's really it, it it makes me really happy that other people are using it and benefiting and enjoying it so right. it's really great now, well, hopefully you'll have lots more success you know sure. um, spreading torah and uh all the goodness about education and everything you're doing. So. Amen, amen. And hatzlacha to you guys too. You're also doing a great, great thing, a great service. And uh, yeah, we should just uh, hear good things. Amen. amen to that. We definitely look forward to speaking with you more in the future. You all the best. Take care. All the best. Bye.